Virtually every school kid today learns that ATP, GTP, CTP, and UTP are the nucleotide building blocks used to make RNA, and the deoxyribonucleotide versions of those are the building blocks used to make DNA. What they don't know, and what you probably haven't learned, is how those nucleotides themselves are made. And that will be the subject of these lectures. I start to talk about the uh, structure of the nucleotides, as we can see here, and introduce some nomenclature so that we're all on the same page. All nucleotides contain three distinct components. The first of those is in the center of the structure on the left, and that's the pentose. A pentose is a five-carbon sugar. On the right side attached to the pentose, as seen in blue, is a base. That base corresponds to either uh, a pair of purines or the pyrimidines. The purines being adenine and guanine, the pyrimidines being cytosine, uracil, or, or thymine. The third component of a nucleotide is at least one phosphate, shown in red on the left. That pho those phosphates can be single, double, or triple, as you see uh, on the uh, screen here. Now, the bases are uh, distinguished by their size, basically. The purines, of course, having a two-ring system, adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines having a single ring, uh, a simpler structure, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Now, nucleotides, as I said, are the building blocks of the nucleic acids, uh, DNA and RNA. Cells make their nucleotides by two distinct pathways. One pathway is called the de novo pathway, meaning that those nucleotides are made completely from scratch, from very, very simple compounds. The other uh, pathway strategy is to use salvage synthesis. And as, as the name would suggest, that means that those nucleotides are made by using pieces of other nucleotides that have been broken down. Now, purines are made in a distinct pathway as well, distinguished from the pathway that's used to make pyrimidines. So we'll talk about them uh, separately. The deoxyribonucleotides that are used to make DNA are made from ribonucleoside diphosphates. So in order to make DNTPs, we first need to make the ribonucleotide versions of those. Last, thymidine nucleotides are made from uridine nucleotides, as we will see. So in order to make thymine to put into DNA, we first got to make the uridine equivalent. Now, as I said, uh, nucleotides are made uh, from very simple components amino acids, one carbon donors, and carbon dioxide. Now, we can see that in the illustration in the figure here. If we look at the sources of the atoms used to make purines, we see that they're not very complicated. We see uh, in green a set of atoms that come from the amino acid glycine. In purple, we see the ones that come from, gl from glutamine. We also see uh, a single carbon from carbon dioxide, a nitrogen from aspartic acid, and two other carbons that come from folate derivatives, and those were described in another lecture in this series. When we look at the, the pyrimidines, it's even simpler. Only three components are necessary to make the ring of a pyrimidine. Carbon dioxide, glutamine, and aspartic acid. And those three components were also uh, used to make purines. So we think that making nucleotides, it takes very simple precursors. It's not a difficult process uh, to understand. Now, the synthesis of the nucleotides is very tightly regulated. Now, this is a very important concept to understand because the cell needs to have the proper ratio of purines to pyrimidines and of each of the individual nucleotides compared to each other. Now, the reason for that is that if the cell gets those out of balance in any way, it makes it much more likely that that cell will suffer mutation. Mutations in cells are usually bad, and cells go to extraordinary lengths to avoid having that happen as much as they can. Now, purine synthesis is different from pyrimidine synthesis in that the purine synthesis begins with the ring being assembled on the ribose sugar. Pyrimidine synthesis, on the other hand, synthesizes the ring first and then attaches it to the sugar later. As we study and learn nucleotide metabolism, we can look at it in a couple of ways. We can look at it from a, a perspective of looking on, out onto a, uh, the, the uh, process from a bigger picture, such as what I show on the screen here, or we can zoom in and focus on individual reactions. Now, for the most part, when I talk about nucleotide metabolism, I will actually use the zoomed out version because while the individual reactions are important, the important message isn't exactly how each process happens, 
but rather how the overall process happens and how that balance that I've described is maintained in, in assembling the purine and pyrimidine nucleotides. Now looking at this in a big picture scenario, we see that the starting molecule is a molecule called ribose 5-phosphate. That's the source of the ribose pentose sugar that appears in there. You can see on the left that it takes several steps, uh, and we'll briefly go through those, to go from the ribose 5-phosphate to make an intermediate known as IMP, inosine monophosphate. IMP is a branch point. You can see that branch forking down uh, from IMP. One side going to the left, making ultimately at the very bottom ATP, and the other branch going to the right, making GTP. These are the two purine nucleotides that we make. Now, the important thing that we get to that point of IMP is that that's one of the places where the balancing occurs to make the proper amounts of each one. We'll also see prior to that point that there's a balance that starts in the very beginning that may be a little difficult to understand, but after we see the bigger picture, I think it will make sense. So the first thing that's done to uh, ribose 5-phosphate is it gets a, 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 a pyrophosphate attached to its carbon number one. And we see that happen in this process. If I look on the right side, uh, on the bottom, we see that there's two phosphates that have been added. Those two phosphates come from ATP, and the product of that reaction is AMP. The enzyme catalyzing that process is known as PRPP synthetase. PRPP synthetase is important in, dis in uh, helping this cell to decide whether to start this process or not. So it's a regulatory enzyme, and we'll see how that regulation occurs in just a bit. In the next reaction, we start to synthesize that purine ring above the ribose. So we see that the diphosphate on the, on the right side has been changed, and that change has, has replaced it with an amine group, as you can see here, to make phosphoribosyl amine. How did that amine get there? Well, that amine got there as a result of a transamination reaction. When I talked about, uh, about amino acid metabolism in another of these lectures, you may remember that transamination was an important way to get amines onto a compound via sort of an exchange. And a common way to do that exchange was to use glutamate or glutamine uh, uh, amino acids. We can see here that glutamine, the GLN, is the source of the amine, and glutamine, having lost its amine, makes glutamate, that's the GLU, and we, we're left then with a phosphoribosyl amine. The enzyme catalyzing that reaction is known as PRPP amidotransferase. And that, too, is a very important enzyme in, in helping the cell to uh, control which nucleotide is being made. And again, we'll see that in just a bit. Now, building a purine ring involves a total of about seven or eight steps. It's a fairly complicated, complicated set of reactions, and my point in bringing up these reactions and showing them to you isn't to get you to memorize the individual steps that are there, but rather to let you see the process by which that ring begins to assemble. The product of the last reaction was phosphorebacillamine, and we see glycine being added to that. Where we had an amine before, we now see that a glycine has been attached to it, and we see that ring on the right side starting to take shape. There's the ribose sugar, there's the phosphate, and there's the base that's starting to be made. The next step of the process adds more to that glycine that was there, and we see it growing, and we see it growing, and now we've seen that we've started to form, or we have completely formed, one of the two rings. The second ring grows, and grows, and grows, and grows. Now, we have almost finished the second ring. You can see on the, on the lower left that the, the first ring that was made is the bottom, and the second ring has almost closed above it. The next step closes that ring. 